to another session of the Gospel Project. Sure glad you could uh, join me this morning on this Sunday morning, September 13th, 2020. Uh, what a great day it is. Uh, today we're going to be in Unit 25, Session 2 of the Gospel Project. The title of today's lesson is Jesus Tells the Parable of the Sons. Uh, before we get started, just want to say a few things. Uh, this COVID situation is still going on, so we're still doing Sunday school by video. But it looks like uh, we're going to slowly start changing things. It looks like on September 20th, uh, we're going to start having uh, children's church in the nursery. Uh, and then it looks like on October 4th, we're going to start back uh, Sunday school with our small groups. I got some great news for the people that are in my class. We're going to eliminate one of the excuses for not coming to Sunday school uh, in our class. We're going to move from the upstairs room. We're no longer going to be in a new building upstairs. We're going to move into the fellowship hall. We're going to be in the middle Sunday school room in the fellowship hall. So I know you guys are excited. We have just eliminated one of the excuses of not coming to Sunday school. You no longer have to climb any stairs. Isn't that awesome? I don't have a problem. Some of the people in my Sunday school class are getting older. I, I don't know what the deal is. Not me. But anyway, it's some exciting stuff. So, let's get started today. And when we talk about Jesus tells uh, the parable of the sons, we're going to be talking about the prodigal. Uh, the prodigal son. Uh, as we talk about this, it's a good idea to understand what is a prodigal. Uh, because I know growing up when I hear the prodigal son, I'm thinking, oh, he's, he's it. He's the man. He is the star of the show. That's not exactly what a prodigal is. Here's a definition of a prodigal. Spending money or resources freely and recklessly. Wastefully extravagant. Having or giving something on a lavish scale. A person who spends money in a reckless, extravagant way. So, we're going to talk about the prodigal son today, just so we got a true understanding of what a prodigal is. So let's get started. We've got a good introduction today. By the way, uh, it is uh, Unit 25, Session 2. It is on page uh, 20 uh, of your student book. If you haven't gotten by the church to pick up a student book, we've got plenty of books. Please stop by and, and pick up you uh, a Sunday school book. So, uh, on page, uh, it's, it's, the lesson starts on page 20. I think it's the next page there. We start with our uh, group time, our introduction. Let's read uh, today's introduction. <clears throat> this is in your book. Uh, Oh, this is the writer talking. Over our manual, <coughs> over our mantle hangs a print of Rembrandt's masterpiece, The Return of the Prodigal Son. At first glance, it doesn't seem to contain much detail. In the foreground, illuminated by some mysterious light, the repentant son kneels before his compassionate father, who is embracing him. This is the main focus of the painting and most people's recollection of the parable. But to the right stands the prodigal's older brother with his hands folded. He too is illuminated because his role in the story is equally prominent. While there are other interesting details we could mention, the main point of both the painting and the parable is right there in the light. The father who welcomes his sinful son with the same love he has for his righteous son, yet this story turns typical categories of the sinful and the righteousness inside out. We're talking about the prodigal son, but that's not the main focus of, of, of the, the, the prodigal is not the star of the, of the parable. We're going to see the older brother and God are all part of this parable, and we need to pick up the key points that it talks about each one. Before we keep going, let's open in a word of prayer. God, thank you for today. God, I thank you for this lesson because we're all, uh, in some way, the prodigal son. Uh, the, the way we live, the way we live apart from Jesus Christ. But God, you're always there to welcome us back in to your loving kindness through your grace. Father, thank you for that. 
Father, just be with this lesson today. Just bind me from this lesson. Please speak through me. Uh, don't let me get in the way of this lesson, Father, with the, the point that's, that's trying to be made today, Father. I just pray that, that as we study this lesson, we all learn from it, Father. I need uh, to learn and, and, and be discipled and dig in as much as anybody, Father. And I just pray through these lessons you speak to me. I just pray we can use what we learn today and apply it to our lives, Father, and also uh, help us to, to spread the gospel, Father. Father, be with everything that's going on in our church be with the ones that's making plans to, to start our children's church. Be with our search committee as we look for a, a, a children's uh, minister, Father, that, that we find the person that you have for our church, Father. Father, just put our personal preferences aside and, and what our wishes are and seek what you want, Father, and follow through with that. Father, this, everything this church does, I pray we do uh, for you and it's through you, Father. Just, just be with our staff. Bless our staff. Uh, bless all our Sunday school teachers, our deacons, everybody, Father, that's trying to be a part of ministering at Three Creeks Baptist Church. Forgive us what we fail you. In Christ's name and I pray. Amen. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, so, we, we read that introduction about uh, uh, the return of the prodigal son, Rembrandt's drawing. So, um, talking about the parable, why do you think this parable is so often called the prodigal son, while the older brother's role is overlooked. And, and we're going to be today in Luke chapter 15. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. We're not going to read all of Luke 15, so go back and read the whole chapter uh, of Luke 15 uh, to get some more context and, and, and dig into this lesson. So why do you think this parable is so often called the prodigal son, while the older brother's role is overlooked? These are some pretty tough answers here. The actions of the prodigal comes first in the parable. Well, naturally. We resonate with the story of a prodigal who returns home to forgiveness and welcome. We like to hear a good story of somebody gone astray, you know, and is reconciled. We readily see ourselves in the prodigal, but not the older brother. We're going to dig into that. I want you to see a lot about this older brother. And people only recall the return of the prodigal and forget the older brother's reservations about his return. You can see where we're going with this lesson. It's more than just talking about the prodigal son. So let's summarize what we're going to talk about today. Most people who have read or heard the parable of the prodigal son understand that it chronicles the dangers of wild living and God's loving acceptance of repentant sinners. But this parable is as much about the older brother as it is about the prodigal. We tend to forget that there are plenty of verses in Luke 15 dedicated to the grumbling of the prodigal's older brother. By depicting the central sins of both the younger and the older brothers, Jesus was showing that these boys are not so different, at least not in heart. In this session, we will examine more closely this famous parable and see further how the stories Jesus told reveal God's goodness and heart to welcome any sinner home. So, today's first point of our lesson is... Selfishness leads to rebellion against the Father's goodness. This is from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 13. Let's read 11 through 13. He also said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger brother gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. So let's pick up, let's dig into those scriptures. Uh, the next paragraph in your book says, Jesus didn't provide a backstory for the, the events of this parable because one wasn't necessary. This story just dives right in, but one small detail does set the stage for the young son's actions. By asking for his inheritance early, before his father's death, the younger son essentially told his father, I wish you were dead. Thus, he dishonored and cut himself all from his father and family because he desired to live for himself. This is the essence of every sin, both from the prodigal and from us today. So, what happened here? The son committed himself to a sinful life, indulging in the desires of the flesh. His actions were self-centered. This was self-worship. 
Rather than honoring his father, as the fifth commandment would have him do, the son sought only to honor and please himself. Does this sound familiar? Can you put yourself in the prodigal son's place? I know I certainly can. In the book of Judges, all the bloodshed and perversion was the result of every person doing whatever seemed right to him. You can see this in Judges chapter 17 and in chapter 21, otherwise known as moral relativism. In a sense, all sin is is a form of moral relativism because we are deciding in that moment that our desires take precedence over God's glory and the needs of others. What's right or wrong becomes subservient to our wishes and whims. It's all about us. So what is the application from all this? We may not think our sins could compare to the brazen actions of the prodigal son. My sins aren't as bad as his. We may not boldly dishonor our parents and then go bankrupt by spending money on wild living. But any sin is a turning from the satisfaction of God to the, to the prospect of satisfying ourselves apart from him. Sin is living as if we were the lords of our own lives, the sovereigns of our own kingdom. When we choose sin, we are choosing to live, live as if our heavenly father were dead just as the prodigal son was choosing to live uh, as his earthly father was dead. So, why might people resist identifying with the prodigal son at this point in the parable? Think about the prodigal son. I mean, he was bad. He did some bad things. He did some wild living. You know, think about that. Why, uh, why at this point in the parable may we resist identifying with him? You know, we're all sinners. Well, his sins are excessive, we may think. We, did, we don't think ourselves capable of sinning on the level of the prodigal does. You know, are there different levels of sin? We don't understand how insidious all sin is. Sometimes we fail to, to understand that sin is sin. We think we're only guilty of respectable sins. I need somebody to tell me what a respectable sin is. That was good stuff, by the way. So, on in your book, it says, in verse 13, Jesus said the inheritance the son took early in his greed was squandered and that his lifestyle was foolish. Whatever experience or possession the son was chasing after in his new life came up short in reality and in the pursuit cost him everything. Just read verses 14 through 16. He should have seen it coming. But do we? Do we see what we what, what's coming when we're living in a, in a, in a, a sinful lifestyle? <clears throat> uh, not often enough. A lifestyle of sin, whether public or private, one day it will cost us everything. To live with yourself at the center rather than God is to live spiritually bankrupt and set yourself up for utter catastrophe and sorrowful emptiness. Ooh, that's a lot of words there. We can imagine the son foolishly telling himself he could turn everything around. You know, no matter how bad it is, on your own, you can always straighten up and turn things around. It's what we think. We can even rationalize that the highs of, the, of his sensuous living were too addictive. But squandering his material possessions landed him in a pigsty, literally. One of the worst places a Jew could live because pigs were unclean by law. Just read Deuteronomy 14. And what's worse, he was so hungry that he wanted to eat the slop the pigs were, uh, ate. Look at Luke 15, what we're studying, verses 14 through 16. Such is the end of a life oriented around oneself. He, he was pretty. He was at a low point in his life. The teacher of Ecclesiastes, and by the way, read Ecclesiastes. It is good stuff. Gave us gave us a philosophical uh, background for the prodigal son in this parable. Possibly the reflections of an elderly Solomon looking back on his life and offering words of caution and wisdom to his younger self or a son. We note how often he declares the heights of his heroism and the peaks of his acclamation as nothing more than vapor, a smoke, a pursuit of the wind. 
Ecclesiastes 1.14. Once you catch it, it vanishes in your hands. The pursuit at the end of it all proves fruitless, worthless, and empty. So what's the application? What's another application we can get from this? The prodigal son tour of debauchery is nothing new. It's nothing new. It still goes on today. People have lived for the sake of their own pleasure since the fall of humankind. One reason this story from Jesus still resonates so well today is that the hedonistic, licentious lifestyle of the younger son has basically become the default state for a typical young adult in the Western world where we live today. You don't even have to renounce your father to live like a prodigal son anymore. You can do it at college in your frat house or on spring break, indulging in sins considered by many to be rites of passage, all on your father's dime. But another enduring constant of this parable is the end result of that kind of living. What happens to the prodigal son is what happens to everyone who goes full, tit, full tilt into self-worship. They end up with nothing to show for it but scars, sorrows, and a life of regrets. Please listen to this last sentence. Nobody gets to their deathbed after all and says, I wished I'd been more selfish. I wished I'd have lived more wastefully. Something to think about. So, what words of warning and encouragement might you give to someone younger than you? Think about the people you know. Think about how their life appears. Um, what kind of words of, of encouragement or warning would you give? I don't have any answers in my book. That's for you to think about. So please think about that. So that leads us into the second point of today's lesson. Sorrow leads to repentance in light of the Father's goodness. And this is Luke 15, verses 17 through 24. And the Bible says, when he came to his senses, the prodigal son, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food? And here I am, dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer, wor I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sa sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. I don't know if you can get all the meaning of this parable, but it is good. It is awesome. It's a, it's a reflection of how the Father loves each of us and how excited he is when he comes to know him through his son, Jesus Christ. So let's, let's dig a little deeper and see what your book says. The prodigal son, he is bottomed out. He has hit rock bottom. He is not just at the end of his money and wild lifestyle, but he is at the end of himself. In coming to Christ, we all must come to the same end. The circumstances will look different for each of us, but until we despair of ourselves, we will not see the beauty of Christ in the gospel. Still, in coming to Christ, we must come in the right way. The prodigal came hoping only to be a hired hand, but his father had other plans. Wasn't that just great news? And that's what the gospel is. It's good news. Because he was humbled uh, by his helpless estate, the prodigal son came to his senses in the pigsty. When he was at rock bottom, when he was at wit's end, he finally came to his senses. And isn't it a shame? That's just what we, what, sometimes that's the, the point that we have to get to before we realize what we need. Everyone is better off back home, he said, even the hired hands. So the younger son humbled himself and went home. He had, 
he did not go to claim his place as a son, but work, to work for his father. In his ignorance, he figured that was the only way of being acceptable to his father, as someone working for his living to pay off his debt. Man, this, this meaning that we're digging out of this gospel is so good. We can't work our way uh, for salvation. You know that. How many people, believers and unbelievers alike, make this mistake that the prodigal son was making in his thinking? Seeing our great sin debt to our great and holy God, we automatically assume that we must begin paying it off. We've been so bad, we've got to pay off a debt ourselves. Even after learning that salvation is freely given to all who worship and believe in Jesus, sometimes we still think we have to, or the worldly people think they have to work that debt off. We are so sorrowful about our debt that we assume the Lord will only bring us on as a hired hand rather than welcome us home as a beloved child. We simply cannot fathom the possibility of His grace. Man, the gospel is too good to believe. It's too good. It is good to, it is believable. It's just, it's just too, too good. It just seems too good that all we have to do is accept Christ and we're welcomed humbly into the Father's uh, uh, bosom. Man, it's, it's this, this lesson today, uh, it speaks volumes to me. And, and, and it's the gospel in a nutshell. Let's see what our book goes on and says. Some have said that the most significant character in this parable is the father. You think about this. There's three characters in this parable. Uh, three main characters. There's the prodigal son, there's the father, and there's the older brother. Uh, so some uh, think that the most significant character in this parable is the father. And father is the most significant being. He corresponds to our heavenly father in this parable, who overflows with loving kindness to all. The Father in the story, like our Heavenly Father, is a giver of grace. Despising the shame, he runs to his once lost son and then throws a party for the son who once wished his father would dead, was dead. So think about it. The word prodigal. We talked about the, the meaning uh, at the beginning of, of this lesson. It's an adjective referring to profuse expenditures and a sense of wastefulness. This applies, of course, to the younger son who squandered his inheritance on reckless living. But maybe we ought to see the father in this story as the most prominent prodigal as he wastes his affection on his disgraced son, lavishing his goodness upon the one deserving of his condemnation. Thinking of God as the prodigal, huh? So, as a pastor and author Tim Keller says... The image of the gospel we receive in this parable of the prodigal son is actually of the prodigal God who loves us, his sinful children, who overwhelm who with overwhelming abundance as he gives us his son. And by extension, he generously gives us all things. And that's Romans 8, 32. So the prodigal son came to the point of seeking first his father's kingdom and everything else was added to him he used up his father's love but still more was added grace turns our expectations and intuitions upside down grace will turn your world upside down god's grace that is in his fulfillment of the law christ put an end to the idea of earning salvation with religion forever Grace really is revolutionary. And it is. It's revolutionary because people just can't imagine. But grace is real. Grace is freely given by a loving Father. So, what has been your experience of the overwhelming grace of God through your faith in Jesus? I can't wait till we can all gather again. Uh, we're going to gather in that new Sunday school room over in the fellowship hall. And we'll be able to have a big room and we won't be out of breath when we get to that room so we can have some good discussions. So I can't wait. So when I ask a question like this that I don't have answers in my book, I can hear what you guys have to say. You guys can help feed me. 
So what has been your experience of the overwhelming grace of God through faith in Jesus? That's your question. Think about it. So that leads us into the third point of the day's lesson. Self-righteousness leads to resenting the Father's goodness. And this is Luke 15, verses 25 through 32. And before I, before I go any further, I do a lot of reading in this lesson. And it's not me sitting here preaching. Because I am facilitating this lesson in the Gospel Project. And the writers, there's a bunch of different writers of these lessons. But man, Lifeway has some great uh, writers that, that contribute to this lesson. And it's so good, I don't want you to miss out on anything. And that's why I do a lot of reading. Because man, it digs into the scriptures and it just brings the scriptures to life. And I don't want you to hear me just up here rattling. I want you to hear... Um, the point of these lessons uh, from somebody that, that is a whole lot smarter than I am. So anyway, that was free of charge. So uh, Luke 15, verses 25 through 32. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, Look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fatted calf for him. Son, he said to him, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You can see where this lesson's going, and you can see what we're fixing to talk about now. We're fixing to dig in to what this meaning about the older brother is all about. Let's see what your book says in the next paragraph. Through the older son's disdain for the younger and his conversation with his father, we can decipher his worldview. Life is a spiritual uh, meritocracy where God's holiness is to be taken seriously and obedience to the law of God should earn you good standing in the world. On the surface, this worldview sounds worthwhile, but in the end, it comes up short because it fails to take seriously God's goodness towards us in the gospel. In fact, it rejects the need for the gospel and leads to resenting those who fall on God's grace. So God is gracious. And that leads us into an essential doctrine from this lesson. So, so th listen to this closely. God is gracious. God's nature is to delight in giving unmerited favor to those who are undeserving. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. His grace towards sinners is found most clearly in the salvation he has provided through Christ. Because of sin, humanity is undeserving of salvation. All of us have turned our backs on God, and as a result, we deserve death, Romans 6, 23. However, instead of leaving people in their sins, God has demonstrated, demonstrated his graciousness, graciousness by providing atonement and forgiveness for our sin through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Amen, amen, hallelujah, and all those things. So, what are we saying here in this parable? <coughs> The parable of the prodigal son is as much about the older brother, older son's legalism as the younger son's hedonism. Our heavenly Father's goodness is not contingent upon the law, as if we could earn His favor through our legalistic efforts. Rather, we experience God's goodness through His grace, namely the person and work of Jesus Christ who put an end once and all to the legal striving and redeems us from the curse of the law through his own perfect obedience on our behalf. Now, isn't that good stuff? This parable is the third in a string of st stories 
uh, Jesus told because the Pharisees and scribes complained about Jesus' welcoming and eating with sinners. Luke 15, 1 and 2, these background passage. Let me read that again. This parable is a third in a string of stories Jesus told because the Pharisees and scribes complained about Jesus' welcoming and eating with sinners. We talked about the Pharisees a lot. Who are the Pharisees? The religious, the people that thought they knew everything. The religious people, the religious leaders of Jesus' time were the Pharisees. Already he had taught that heaven rejoices over sinners who repent. That's in this same background passage, 15, 3 through 10. With this third parable, the Pharisees and scribes did not need a cautionary tale of the dangers of wild living, which they already believed was sinful. What they needed was to have their tidy moral universe disrupted. This parable is more about grace's welcome than it is in sin's danger. While Jesus has definitely shown that sin is destructive, he also shows that the older brother's self-righteousness and pride in his own obedience was just as distancing between himself and the father. In other words, the Pharisee, the older brother, that religious person, that person that thinks because they come to church every Sunday, because they can recite all the uh, books of the Bible because they know what the Ten Commandments says. Just because they know all that, that you know, they think that, they think that's all it takes. They're self righteous. While Jesus definitely shown that sin is destructive, I read that he also showed that the older brother's self righteousness and pride in his own obedience was just this distance between himself and the Father. With the prodigal home. Who is now who is now the lost son? Who is the one really far from the kingdom? The prodigal had repented and enjoyed the ensuing celebration. The older brother refused to go in and celebrate, holding a grudge against his younger brother and even more against his father for his grace and goodness. You see how this is turned from the prodigal? The prodigal's got it going on now. Uh, he he's he's asked for forgiveness. Uh, he's he's been forgiven. He's been given the kingdom, uh, but the older brother who was Mr. Goody Two-Shoes who had stayed all along, well, he was jealous. He, he just doesn't get it. So here's a commentary about this. According to Jewish custom, the oldest son was the honor bearer of the family. But throughout the Old Testament, family after family shows us the younger brother's outwitting, outlasting, and outshining the older brothers. The failure of the older brother to live up to his honorable position, it began with Cain and proceeded through Esau to Joseph's brother and to David's brothers. The younger siblings themselves were not perfect, of course, but one way God reinforced his penchant for shaming the wise with the foolish and the strong with the weak, 1 Corinthians 1.27, was by making the older serve the younger uh, serve the younger, and we see that in Genesis and in Romans. In the parable of the prodigal son, the older brother once again proves himself unsuitable for the role of carrying on the legacy of the family, prompting the question, is there a good older brother? Is there a good older brother? Not in the Pharisees and in the scribes who complained about younger brothers repenting. The only good older brother you got it, is Jesus, who came to seek and to save the lost and call them to repentance and the celebration of heaven through faith in him. So that leads us into this last question. What are some ways Christians can exhibit a legal, legalistic worldview? Think about that. Do, 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 we think, or, or, do we sometimes act like the Pharisees? Holding others to their own personal standards rather than holding themselves to the standards of scriptures. That's some way us Christians, that's why we can exhibit a legalistic worldview is by holding others to their own personal standards rather than holding themselves to the standards of the scriptures. By refusing to fellowship with sinners and to welcome them into the body of Christ when they repent. The Pharisees couldn't stand it when when. 
Jesus uh, uh, fellowship with, with the tax collectors and the sinners. Basing their standing with God on their level of obedience or disobedience instead of trusting in God's grace shown in Jesus. Well, that concludes this lesson uh, that we all think is about the prodigal son. And it is about the prodigal son, but it's about the prodigal son, it's about God the Father, and it's about uh, the older brother. Uh, all play important roles in this, and they all teach us life lessons. So, <clears throat> Jesus is the good older brother. He will wander out into the wilderness wherever he must go to search out the lost. Luke 15, 3-7. That's why he came. That's why Jesus came to this earth. That's his business. That's what Jesus is all about. He will light up the house, put the chairs up on the tables, and sweep every floorboard and into every corner to find that one lost coin. Look at Luke 15, 8-10. He will go searching every gambler's den whorehouse and pigsty until he finds his younger brothers to bring home. Over and over again, we see in the Gospels as Jesus was extending the welcome of the kingdom to the lowest of the low that he was scandalizing the self-righteous older brothers because we too have forgiven, have been forgiven for our sin through Jesus. We must resist the lure of pride and choose to celebrate the Father's goodness in welcoming home any repentant sinner. All this means is that we've got to get outside the walls of this church. Our mission is outside the walls of this church. It is our job. It is our duty. It is our obligation. We should want to come to church, gather uh, as, as fellow believers, worship, give honor and glory to God, build each other up, learn but then our job is not finished on Sunday morning our job is to leave this building and go out into the world and be the church yes we come to church but we got to go out and be the church because we're not going to reach the lost yes we'll, we'll reach some lost and sinners in this building but we've got to go out we've got to go out and, and spread the gospel we can't expect to sit here every Sunday morning and have people pass by on Highway 15 and think, hmm, I think I'll stop and go to church today. That's just not going to happen. We've got to go out. We've got to invite them. We've got to open up the scriptures. We've got to show them how they need Jesus Christ. We've got to show them that there's only one way to heaven, and that is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's nothing they can do at all to earn uh, to earn uh, that relationship. It is freely given through God's grace. Again, we have got to get outside the walls of the church and be the church. That's our commission from Jesus. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. I hope uh, I hope you got as much out of this lesson as I did. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it excites me. I hope I can show some of that. Authority enthusiasm that I have, I hope that will carry over to you. Uh, I hope that I didn't do anything uh, that would hinder uh, your relationship with Jesus through this lesson. Um, and also, if, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you would like to talk to somebody further uh, about this grace that is freely given, please contact the church. Uh, contact me. Uh, you can comment on whatever social media platform that you're watching this video on. Uh, I'll get back with you. I, I would love to talk with you. There's a lot of people at this church that would love to talk to you. And I'd like to give you a personal invitation to come join us here at Three Creeks. But if you don't feel comfortable coming here to Three Creeks, don't, don't, don't hold it against all the other churches because you have a problem here, go to church somewhere. Get involved with a fellow body of believers because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what Jesus wants us to do. Again, I've gotten back on my soapbox and I apologize. You're welcome at Three Creeks, but if you don't want to come to Three Creeks, go to church somewhere. This All I ask is that you go to a church that Jesus Christ is the head. That's all I ask. Let's close in a word of prayer. 
God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this lesson, God. Thank you um, for your son coming to this earth, living as a man, showing us and teaching us about all things, how we should live, what it takes to have uh, to spend eternity with God in heaven. Thank you for dying on a cross for our sins, Lord. But most of all, thank you for rising on that third day, Lord, um, and for ascending into heaven uh, and preparing a place for us one day when we do accept that free that grace, that free gift of salvation. Father, I just pray that if anybody is watching this uh, lesson today and if they don't know you, I pray they've come to know you through this. If they do know you, I pray their relationship has been strengthened. Father, I love you. I want to live for you. Forgive me where I fail you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hope to see you guys in person on October 4th. And I also want to stand in a free invitation to anybody that would like to sit in on these last few videos that we're doing and help me, help me present the lesson. Uh, Jason McGuggan was going to do it this week, but we had a scheduling conflict. We couldn't work out. Hopefully, maybe Jason will join me next week. But if you'd like to, again, get a hold of me. Have a good week.